Hi, my name is Nate Higgins. I teach a class here at UHP called Reality 101, a survey of the human predicament. You're freshmen, you just got here. If you've been paying attention, you know that we are live at an amazing but also a challenging time. My class is 150 hours of content. We're going to parse that into one hour, four 15 minute videos here on how all this stuff fits together. The first video is going to be about the brain, human behavior, and how that impacts our decisions, how we get along with others, our consumption. The second video is going to be about energy, growth, and the economy, and how energy and natural resources underpin our modern economic system and how this might change in the future. The third video is going to be about the environment, not only climate change, but our impacts on the oceans, other species, uh, and what potentially could be a uh, mass extinction. Um, the fourth video is going to put all this together, how the system synthesis uh, arises from all these components, what it means for the future, what it means for your own lives. Uh, the purpose of all these Nexus segments is so that you can have meaningful conversations with your classmates, with other students, about what's really happening in the world as it pertains to your own career, your own college situation, and your futures. First, here are the two University of Minnesota students helping me with these videos, Lou Blank and Carly Roosevelt. Hi, I'm Carly. And I'm Lou. I graduated from the U in 2018. And I will be graduating next year. Okay, let's get started. Perhaps the most important thing to pay attention to when analyzing the human predicament is the human. Quick review. There's been life on our planet Earth for nearly 4 billion years. Insects for 600 million years, mammals roughly 100 million. The largest mammals to make it through the KT extinction event 65 million years ago were akin to squirrels or tiny shrews, and these then developed into the mammals which exist today, some of which just happen to develop large brains and self-awareness. We tend to think of humans as special, we are certainly unique, but in the same way that beetles or tree frogs are unique. But what makes us unique is of particular relevance to our planetary and cultural dilemmas we currently have and will be the topic of this video. Imagine you were an alien anthropologist, beaming skeletons, samples, fossils, and creatures aboard your ship, trying to puzzle out what the species was like, what sort of foraging behavior, social structure, living conditions, what could you infer just from the remains or skeletons of Earth's species? We might infer the dots looking like a face were useful for avoiding predation to look like a larger creature instead of just a defenseless moth. This creature might be tougher. The leading hypothesis is that the stripes make the zebra seem like a collection of smaller animals and thus more difficult prey, confusing the tsetse fly. What about this species? The body of this odd-looking creature is an awesome example of adaptations that made its ancestors survive and reproduce. The sclera, the white part of the eyes, and the small mouth were products of social cooperation. The bipedalness, lack of fur, and sweat glands all helped to be successful long-distance runners and hunters. But the brains of this creature, which is us, Homo sapiens, are just as much a product of evolution as our bodies. What isn't talked about much is how our brains and behavior were also adaptive. Homo sapiens has existed in roughly the same anatomical form for about 300,000 years. At 20 years per generation, this is about 15,000 generations, all but a fraction of which we lived in small bands of around 100 individuals, mostly on the plains of Africa. The environment for most organisms is very similar to that of their ancestors. So the behaviors they do today, wake up and go chase some prey, is similar to what they've always done, getting calories to maximize their biological fitness. But not so humans. Our situation today is radically different than our past. The modern human brain is an evolved organ to a Stone Age context. Shown here is a hunter-gatherer in Botswana scanning the horizon for game or movement. At the right is a modern stock trader. The man on the left is hunting for game to feed his family. The man on the right is trying to make money to turn into food and other things to feed his family. 
Both of their brains are probably experiencing similar motivation and feelings, different environments, same emotional states. This is a very important point. We are adaptation executors, not fitness maximizers. Our deep feelings direct us to execute adaptations which proved fit in the evolutionary past, even when those adaptations make no rational sense in the present or in the future. Simply put, we go through our days trying to approximate the daily emotional states of our ancestors. The behaviors of eating, playing games, trading stocks, or whatever is secondary. The mechanism, kind of obvious when you think about it, is to seek the same neurotransmitters, endocrine cascades, and hormones that our ancestors experienced in what was a radically different environment. And the way these minds respond to modern technology, advertising, social media, and a global economic system approaching 8 billion people pose very specific challenges to our physical and environmental futures. Let's now look at five brief examples. Natural selection worked its magic via relative fitness. What is our modern version of a peacock's tail? While we make social statements with our cars, our clothes, our technology, our houses, our toys, our comments, and even our friends. As such, we don't so much appreciate absolute well-being, wealth, or comfort, but are pulled into relative comparisons by metrics promoted and advertised by our culture. This is Tiger Woods' yacht, right next to his ex-wife's new boyfriend yacht, which is nine feet longer. When he pulls in, is Tiger happy he's one of the world's richest athletes and has the second biggest yacht on the dock? Why do we laugh when we see this? What is it that we immediately understand about the situation? Extrapolate this constant need to compare in a global economic system with advertising, designer brands, and metrics of success linked to resource use, and we might see the relevance. Both in Homo sapiens and pre-hominid times, neural machinery that would have noticed things that were different, a flash of color, movement in the bushes, and called the brain's attention to it, hey, what's that, be careful, or it's food, finally, would have been adaptive. Dopamine is a chemical messenger in your brain associated with the wanting in brain reward centers. It's released in anticipation of a reward, whether that's a fresh slice of pizza, a favorite song, or the unexpected attention from a high status or attractive person. Humans, as animals, are susceptible to modern stimuli that are more prevalent and much more intense than in our ancestral past. Called supernormal stimuli, some examples are Instagram, pornography, drugs, and all-you-can-eat buffets. When you're playing and winning Fortnite, your brain thinks you just bagged an antelope or outconquested a hostile neighboring tribe. It doesn't know you're sitting on a couch in a big house accessing coal and natural gas-fired internet servers somewhere. In our ancestral environment, we also had frequent spikes of dopamine. A successful hunt, a dalliance in the bushes, a defense against a lion or neighboring tribe. But between these moments, there were long hours or weeks on the sun-baked savanna, time to dream, tell stories, look at the sky and birds, etc. All beautiful things, but very low in intensity versus what we have today. In contrast, our modern culture gives us 24-7 access to stimulation. This stimulation light is always turned on, raising our baseline expectations of dopamine and the expectation of reward. Here's a bizarre example of this. When there was a false incoming missile warning to Hawaii last year, there was a plunge in pornography traffic versus that time on an average Saturday. That's to be expected. People thought they were going to die in a few minutes from a nuclear bomb. But when the tweets came out that the missile warning was an error, there was a 48% jump in porn traffic versus the average Saturday. I was on high alert worried about a nuclear missile. How can I continue to get this intense feel-good neurotransmitter? Apparently reading a book or making a sandwich wasn't sufficient. Perhaps this is an upsetting example, but it's a glimpse into this cultural prevalence of dopamine and habituation to high stimulation baselines. Humans didn't evolve to see and understand reality in the true sense. Fitness was determined by the usefulness of an organism's perception, not the accuracy. 
Because of this, in a massively novel modern world, we have hundreds or even thousands of cognitive biases. One example, seeing the face of an imaginary predator in the forest when none was really there is a lot better than missing a real predator face that is there. One prominent cognitive bias you might have heard of is confirmation bias, where we respond to facts and data only if they fit with our beliefs, emotions, and what prominent people in our tribe are saying. Here's another weird bias, loss aversion. Humans respond much more to losses than to gains. If you start with $10,000 investment and you make $1,000, and then from $11,000 you lose $1,000, the emotional distress of losing 1000 is measured to be much stronger than the happiness you got from an equivalent $1,000 gain. We might see how this evolved. A week without food might mean death, but an extra week of food didn't mean an extra week of life. As we get into energy and money in the next Nexus module, we'll see how this loss aversion dynamic could be of central importance in coming decades. Being aware of these blind spots is the first step in mitigating their effect on ourselves and on our culture. We are biological organisms, long-lived but still with finite lifespans. Our ancestors that deferred consumption would have been outcompeted by organisms that didn't. Because of this, we overly care about the present and we emotionally discount the future to such an extent that it exists only as an abstraction in most of our minds. Economists measure the extent that we prefer the present over the future via something called a discount rate. The steeper the discount rate, the more the person is addicted to the present. Drug users and drinkers, risk takers, people with low IQ scores, people who have heavy cognitive workloads, and men as opposed to women, tend to steeply discount events or issues in the future. Unfortunately, most of our modern challenges are in the future. Recognition that the future exists and that we are part of it springs from a relatively new brain structure, the neocortex. It has no direct connection to the deep brain motivational centers that communicate urgency to us. An example, when asked to plan a snack for next week between chocolate or fruit, People chose fruit 75% of the time. When choosing a snack for today, 70% of them chose chocolate. When choosing a movie to watch next week, 63% plan to watch an educational documentary. But when choosing a film for tonight, two-thirds picked a comedy or sci-fi. We have great intent for the future until the future becomes today. Our neocortex can imagine them, but we are emotionally blind to long-term issues like climate change and energy depletion. The future isn't real to us emotionally. Which explains why a music video might get 6 billion views, while information more relevant to our future gets a few hundred or thousand. In our ancestral past, sometimes entire groups would perish while other groups would survive. Those tribal units which were more cohesive, cooperative, and which worked together versus a common enemy had a competitive advantage. Because of this, we quickly and easily form groups, and we defend our group versus ostracizing outgroups. This can be at a serious level of politics, nation states, or more trivial things like sporting teams, or whether we're Lord of the Ring fans or Harry Potter fans. This is why we see current political discussions on social media becoming more and more about the messenger as opposed to the message. But the fact that group behavior shaped us as much as individual behavior has a silver lining. Diversity between cultures is often greater than diversity within cultures and allows natural selection to occur at the group level. At the largest scales, this implies cultural inheritance can occur far more rapidly than genetic evolution. This is one of the great hopes for the future that we do, in theory, have the ability to rapidly shift our cultural mores and aspirations. Okay, summary of this brief brain behavior video. We evolved. Our brains are a product of what worked in the past, just like our bodies are. We intensely care about social status. We are easily hijacked by modern stimuli and can easily become addicted. 
We didn't evolve to see reality, so we have a very long list of cognitive biases. As biological organisms, we care about the present much more than we care about the future. And we are groupish and also can operate at scales greater than the individual. As you go through your semester, periodically try to think about how you think. This is called metacognition. Notice when anything feels good. It likely feels that way because it helped your ancestors survive. Think about whenever you feel bad, what just happened. What you just did was likely adverse to your ancestors' fitness. It's hard to overstate the importance of this topic because it's our mind. It's our brain. It's how we experience the world. And understanding where it comes from and why we feel the way we feel can offer invaluable insight into who we are as human beings and how we interact in the modern world. I, I think that when we're thinking about complicated problems that we're trying to solve in the world, viewing it through the lens of, you know, this is shaped by, you know, how our brains have evolved and, and that's why we're acting the way we are is really important. Uh, I used to think of, you know, a big issue like climate change was an issue I hope to, you know, help solve during my lifetime. Uh, I used to think of that as just like, you know, bad corporations being greedy. And that's certainly part of it. But understanding that it's much deeper than that. It's our quest for, for dopamine. It's our quest for um, stimulation. It's it's our inability to understand and care about long-term problems uh, that affects you know everyone, as opposed to you know just short-term problems that are affecting one person. Understanding that uh, helps us understand the real roots of the problems, and understanding the real roots of the problems that humanity is facing is essential to actually solving them. And I think, as University of Minnesota students, our job should be to to try to solve these big problems. I have a lot of faith in our future and in cultural evolution's ability to change it, or at least influence it. We're a highly social species, and a lot of what we do is based on what we see other people doing. And I think even if there's a small group of people interested and passionate about these things, it can snowball. Even now, I feel like as a culture, we're holding ourselves more accountable for things. People aren't wanting to use plastic anymore. and a lot of that is social checking from other people and whether or not that's okay to do anymore. Um, I have an immense faith in this generation that is going to be facing all of these obstacles because I think young people are finding an incredible power within themselves and really speaking up for what they believe in. For me, I've been able to, to say, okay, why don't I just spend a day in nature? Because I understand that my brain is being hijacked by these modern high stimulation wonders. And I have recognized that I just spent my entire day, 12 hours of the day on a computer. Um, and I decide as a result of understanding this to go out into nature and just take a short walk. To discuss in your Nexus group, number one, please share something with your cohort that would cause you to lose social respect and status. Just kidding, but see how that felt? Do you think addiction to modern technology and stimuli is a problem? How is it related to sustainability in the future? How might we compete for things that are less resource intensive in the future? Do you have any other reactions or insights to learning about the human brain and behavior? Next week, energy, money, growth, and the economy.